people become in times of great danger very indifferent to appearances. These poor, bedraggled, footsore wretches who would suddenly appear in the gray of the morning having walked 10 or 15 miles during the night. A haversack and canteen. That was their whole equipment except their arms. And like greyhounds, they scoured the country, snatching and eating their food. Hello, Johnny. Why don't you wear better clothes? And in an instant came the retort from an old North Carolinian. These are good enough to kill hogs in. point is, Maryland Heights was never seized by the Confederates. The Federals handed it over. Hell and damnation! They are coming down! They are coming down! John Brown's body lies moldering in the grave, and when we were marching on, it was really the soul of John Brown. When we got up, we found every woman and child gone, took our wagon, and moved everything, several of the neighbors' servants gone at the same time. I've got to steal away, steal away home. Got love to stay My Lord, he calls me, he calls me by the thunder, the trumpet sounds within my soul. And I ain't got long to stay. about how enslaved African Americans in Jefferson County fled to behind federal lines at Harper's Ferry to freedom in 1862 and then lost that freedom when Harper's Ferry and 12,000 soldiers were captured by Confederate forces later that same year. Got long to stay. From the Farm Journal, kept by Ann Hoof. February 24th, Monday. Boys cutting and hauling wood. Mr. Chu here. He and Mr. Hoof went to town. Returned at 3 p.m., then to the mill. Thunder and showery this morning, blowing terribly all day. All fencing down. February 25th, Tuesday. George hauled load of bacon to town, Jim and Ned in the woods. After dinner, went to thrashing clover seed. Mr. Hoof left at 9 a.m. 
Mr. Langdon here this morning. Gert and myself walked to town. Federal troops crossing pretty rapidly at the ferry, so report says. Fine day. February 26th, Wednesday. Hands thrashing clover seed. I went to Mrs. Chew's and spent the day. Gert walked over after dinner. Commenced to rain about 4 p.m. Things look dark and gloomy. February 27th, Thursday. Hands thrashing until 2 p.m. Too windy to continue. Mr. Eichelberger here on his way from Winchester. Mrs. McFadden and Mrs. Ristler here. Federal troops in town. Mr. R. Washington and Mr. B. Cook taken prisoners. Wendy. An Indiana soldier's first impressions of Virginia, coming in at Harper's Ferry and visiting Charlestown. On February 26th, Wednesday, we crossed the Potomac into Virginia. This we regarded as an event of great importance. We were at last upon insurgent soil. Harper's Ferry was a fitting place to begin an advance against the rebellion. As regiment after regiment crossed today, the air rang with the melody, John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave, but his soul goes marching on. This was always a favorite song with the Union Army. In singing it, the Union soldiers were speaking better than they knew, though in taking up arms, nor even in singing the song, most of them did not mean that it should be so. Their victorious marches, which were always enlivened and made easier by the singing, were to bring about the end for which John Brown had died. When they were marching on, it was really the soul of John Brown. It was no trouble to find empty houses in Harper's Ferry. The population had been largely employed before the war in the government arsenal. This was now in ruins. After spending one night in the houses of Harper's Ferry and another in camp nearby, we were marched out late in the evening to Charlestown. Our camp there was on a high ridge at the northeastern edge of the town, opposite the residence of ex-Senator Hunter, a person visiting that location in time of peace, especially in summer, will find it very charming, commanding, as it does a view not often surpassed. There was a high cold wind blowing, and the wagons were getting up with tents and rations, rendering our conditions very cheerless. Only part of the regiment put their tents up when they did arrive, while part lay down under the big oak trees and went to sleep. (laughs) The next morning, the latter found their scant covering reinforced by four or five inches of snow. Our interest in Charlestown was also greatly heightened by its relation to the grim old apostle and martyr of freedom for the slave. This being the county seat of the county in which his offense was committed, it was here that John Brown was tried, convicted, 
and died on the gallows. Many of us visited the chief points of interest in his heroic drama. We saw the jail where he was confined, the courtroom into which he was carried on a litter to be tried, where with his conscientiousness, that of a medieval martyr, he refused to permit the plea of mental derangement in any form to be entered in his behalf, and where with fortitude he received his sentence. We were also shown the field where he was publicly executed and the very instruments, platform and gibbet, by which it was accomplished. We remained in Charlestown over a week, occupied chiefly in guarding the property of persons in the rebel army or who had fled on the approach of our army. General McClellan arrived at Harper's Ferry on Wednesday, February 26th, and remained there until Friday, witnessing the principal part of the operations. General Banks has established his headquarters on the road from Harper's Ferry to Bolivar. The main body of General Banks' division rests in the vicinity of Charlestown. No disaster or accident has occurred since its concentration at and departure from Sandy Hook to cause any anxiety to friends at home. Three inches of snow fell here today. The hitherto rancorous secessionists now pay marked respect to the federal uniforms and the Union citizens who have been compelled to succumb to rebel force are elated with the prospects of the future. It is gratifying to perceive that the county through which the army has passed bears marks of the usual agricultural industry. And it is apparent that the future cereal crops of this prolific region have not been neglected. As we may suppose, town and country are destitute of important articles of consumption, but there is no lack of bread, meat, and coarse clothes. That same day, David Hunter Strother of General Banks staff, who was also from Martinsburg and had respected family living in Charlestown, wrote disparagingly in his diary while underestimating the Confederate Army. He wrote, The women of this county all seem fully assured that we will presently be driven back. I never saw such deep-seated infatuation. The men take more practical views and generally seem to have given the thing up. Some of them are still fearful as to ultimate results. <clears throat> I have been struck with the seedy, old-fashioned appearance of the whole people here. They look as if they had just come out of the ark. In the afternoon, I went to the headquarters of General Banks and found him perplexed at hearing nothing from Winchester. I reiterated to him my firm belief that there were not more than 5,000 men there and that no resistance was intended. He didn't seem satisfied, and as I started to walk down the street, he proposed to go with me. As we passed down from the porch, I saw someone in charge of a file of men with fixed bayonets. Uh, in the darkness, I didn't recognize the prisoner, but as he called my name in an undertone, I perceived it was my messenger returned from Winchester. I mentioned the matter to the general, and we immediately retired with the man to his private chamber, and the examination corroborated my former knowledge fully and was highly satisfactory to the commander. We went to bed with a sense of relief.
The presence of a large federal army in Harper's Ferry in Charlestown gave local enslaved African Americans an opportunity to obtain freedom by passing through the federal lines and offering to do work. Their actions were on such a large scale that they did indeed foster a formal policy with the same objectives. Strother wrote in his diary March 8th, Saturday, Fair and mild. An excitement was produced in town by the arrival of a wagon load of Negro women and children with bag and baggage as if bound for a free country. They were stopped in front of the provost marshal's office for a long time and were the theme of much speculation for the citizens and soldiers. I understand they were forwarded to Harper's Ferry but numbers of men have flocked into town more or less every day since our occupation. First, they were arrested and put into jail, but as the number increased, it was asked what was to be done with them. The quartermaster from Harper's Ferry had just desired a detail of men to load and unload army stores, so it was suggested to send the Negroes there to do the work and so decided. Each day since they have gathered in, they have been marched in squads to Harper's Ferry and having disposed of the stores are still occupied in the repairing of the railroad. This is all fairly in accordance with the professed intentions of the government. The sending forward of the women and children however, looks ominous and may bear a dark interpretation. Let us hear it explained. For my own part, I would be glad to see the whole system wiped out, but the government cannot do it without sacrificing both principle and promises and without involving itself in endless and insupportable troubles. Hundreds of contrabands are hourly seeking refuge within our lines, but they are allowed to roam at large without espionage or care. In fact, but little notice is taken of them except to prevent their return beyond their posts. Richard Washington, the brother of the late John A. Washington, is also now confined to Harper's Ferry. Charles Aglenby and his family lived at Mount Pleasant Farm, and in 1860, they owned 20 persons. In his diary, March 10th, Monday, 1862, he wrote, Negroes go into the Union lines. Last night left the premises the following slaves. Martha, 17 years old, sound, healthy, stout, color rather light, Laura, Black, 39 years old, medium size, handy at all works. Lewis, 23 years old, not very tall, but thick, it's set complexion, copperish. Bob, 17 years old, mulatto, chunky, but not tall or large for his age. Henry Robinson, dark complexion, slender male, age supposed to be 30 or upwards. He is the property of Mrs. Elizabeth Strider and had Laura for his wife. March 13th, Wednesday, left last night, Ralph Madison Hall, age 26, dark, good-looking, heavy-set, medium-height, boot and shoemaker. Silas Hall, ditto from Mr. Conklin, about the same time, age 14 years. 
March 24th, Monday. George W. Cockrell notified me this morning that Rebecca went off with her husband last night. She will be 32 years old next November, medium height, dark color, large eyes, active, intelligent, good seamstress, and handy at all women's work. April 14th, Monday. Zachary Blair left to my service. He was about 59 years old, dark complexion, medium-sized, sound constitution. April 24th, Thursday. Last night, Ralph, Maria, and Sally went off, took the wagon, two mares, and two mules with the gear, The hind gear was new throughout. It was retaken and brought back. Mr. Smallwood and Jim went to the ferry to help look for the team. The African Americans enslaved at the farm of James L. Hoof also left unexpectedly to the protection of the Federal Army at Harper's Ferry and then refused to return. And Hoof wrote, March 2nd, Sunday. Sunday, we did not go to church. Mrs. Rissler and Mrs. Cox here in the evening. Four soldiers passed by and went toward the mill, snowing quite hard until 4 p.m. March 3rd, Monday. Raining until 12 noon. Hands hauling straw. Mr. Cox and Mr. Eisler here in the evening. Six soldiers called and asked if we had seen any of their men. They treated me with respect and touched nothing. March 4th, Tuesday. Hands at the clover seed. Mrs. James Cox spent the day with me. Six soldiers called and asked for dinners. I had no fault to find with them. They treated me with respect. Beautiful day. Mr. Chu here for a short time. March 8th, Saturday, hands hauling straw and fodder, Mrs. McFadden and myself at Mrs. Cox's, feeding soldiers all day. House was searched by four officers, five kept guard, one sheep killed and carried off. Pleasant day, March 12th, Wednesday. When we got up, we found every woman and child gone, took our wagon, and moved everything. Several of the neighbor's servants gone at the same time. George and Jim alone here remaining. Mr. Humphrey, Mr. Eisler, Bobby and Aldrich Chew here. Mrs. Cox here, Mr. Spar here to see me. Sent in for the wagon. Did not come till late. Mrs. Strother's man drove it out, and I paid him one dollar. Cousin Edward Wager came down at 7 p.m., remained all night. This place looks deserted. Pleasant day, young chickens, the first, and one lamb. March 14th, Friday, George and Jim hauling in clover seed. Mrs. Ristler here in the evening. Mr. Mason came back from the ferry. Did not see the servants, but heard they were kept pretty close. Federal troops coming to town again from Winchester. They have taken possession of Winchester. Pleasant day. March 16th, Sunday. Sunday did not go to church. Mrs. Harris here after dinner. George went to town. He heard the servants were suffering some at the ferry. Cloudy and windy. Four lamps. March 17th, Monday. George drove Mr. Mason and myself to town. I got a pass for George to go to the ferry. He saw the servants. They were not willing to come back. Returned at 6 p.m. Dr. Mason here. Damp. Sick lamb died. March 19th, Wednesday. Hands hauling straw and fodder. Mr. Mason and myself walked to Mrs. Lackland's to see about hiring a woman from her. 
I was at Mrs. Whistler's after dinner. Pleasant day. Raining at six. At the beginning of the Civil War, Hugh Nelson Pendleton of Westwood, a farm near Ripon, told his slaves that they were free to go where they pleased. One of them, George Slow, who was born there in 1830, attached himself to Captain Urey of the 71st Pennsylvania Regiment when the latter's company passed by Westwood on its way from Winchester to Bolivar Heights in March of 1862. From that time till near the close of the war, George Slow was in the service of Francis Adams Donaldson, who later joined the 118th Pennsylvania Corn Exchange Regiment of Philadelphia. Slow wrote a long letter written from Bolivar Heights on Saturday, March 15, 1862, to his brother in Philadelphia, telling him of his movements at Harper's Ferry, Charlestown, Berryville, and Winchester, and of the plantation at Westwood. Another local African American who went with Banks was John Dotson, the great great grandfather of James Lester Taylor of Charlestown. Taylor said, The name of my great great grandfather on my mother's side was John Dotson. He was with General Banks of the Union Army in 1862. The Union Army came through Charlestown, and many slaves came with Banks. Dotson was about 18 or 19 years old, and he stayed with Banks wherever he went. I think it was the Second Battle of Winchester when Stonewall Jackson had Banks on the move. They came through Harper's Ferry and then retreated into Maryland. Many other blacks stayed on in the area. Annie Marmion, a young girl, later wrote of Harper's Ferry's new arrivals. She wrote, After the weary months of winter were passed, the blockade was raised. The Yankees poured into town. Many officers had their families with them from every part of the state that the soldiers visit. Contrabands, as the runaway slaves were called, poured into Harper's Ferry and its population was soon greater than ever before. Among these contrabands, especially among the children, there was great sickness and mortality. For these runaway slaves that claimed many a tender victim, which thanks to the watchful zeal of Mary Cotton Hall, departed with the saving wages of baptism wet upon their brows, to enjoy eternal bliss. George Wingate from New York remembered 5,000 freedom-seeking African Americans at Harper's Ferry. He wrote, At this time, there was a great feeling among a certain class in the North, and in particular, Maryland and Kentucky, in regard to interfering with the slaves. And the government had taken a, a neutral position on the subject so as to not defend the border states. The orders were strict that Negroes were not to be permitted to pass inside the Union lines, but it was one thing to make orders and another to enforce them. My 22nd New York prided itself on obeying orders, but it proved in practice to be impossible. For its members, or for those of any other northern organization, went on picket to see the color of the poor, bedraggled, footsore wretches who would suddenly appear in front of them in the gray of the morning, having walked ten or fifteen miles during the night, seeking protection of the Union lines. Frequently a woman carrying a baby and with little children clinging to her skirts. The men carried their few possessions in a big bundle tied to a stick and the women usually toted a roll of bedding.
As they approached, the pickets invariably found something that required their attention in another part of their beat so that the contrabands slipped through without their noticing them. The rush of these into the lines was very great at Harper's Ferry, and it was soon crowded with nearly 5,000 runaway slaves. How they lived was a mystery. They crowded the empty houses and overran the camp, washing clothes, selling pastry, berries, and similar articles, and doing the odd jobs. Nearly every mess, and many of the men, had a servant who was glad to do anything for something to eat or for a small quantity of loose change. Confederate General Stonewall Jackson tried on May 30, 1862, to capture Harper's Ferry, the Federal's last foothold in Virginia. But he fails. Freedom Land is still free for the once enslaved. Wrote the New York Times reporter, The contest is over for the present at Harper's Ferry, as the rebels have left en masse. Until recently, Harper's Ferry, including Bolivar, has been uncertain what would be its fate. The inhabitants lay nervously and sleeplessly in their beds for several nights. They made a general stampede over the reconstructed railroad bridge across the Potomac into Maryland. Men, women, and children, contrabands, all congregated under cover of the darkness, for fear of the descent of an overwhelming force of the rebels and remained there until daylight and for assuring intelligence warranting them to return. The contrabands, for the most part, took the grand mountainsides of Loudoun and Maryland Heights for their walls and the heavens for their roof. Old sheds and freight cars, stoops, and ledges of the huge overhanging rocks also gave shelter to families. Farm work is now done by hired hands in the absence of the enslaved crew at the Hoff Farm. Ann Hoff writes, July 1st, Wednesday. Hands plowing corn, two black men came to work for me, will remain through harvest. Mr. Reineman here this morning. I was at Mrs. Rissler's this evening. George Reineman made a day, left tonight for harvest for Mr. Chu. Pleasant. Font went to Cable Town. Liney here, I gave her an order to get a pair of shoes. July 2nd, Thursday, raining all day. George went to town before dinner. Mr. Mason also in town at Milstead's after dinner. Jim went to Mr. Harris to grind hominy. Four white and two colored hands came this morning. I employed them. Young men in blue uniforms try to fill a Harper's Ferry summertime. George Wingate, a soldier from New York, wrote, It is a curious thing about military life that the putting on of a uniform seems to destroy the sense of personal responsibility and to make grown men act like boys. Unless watched and governed by their officers, they will perpetuate all sorts of wild pranks and glory in it. Many are apt to drink to excess, if they can get liquor. Consequently, military authorities are rigorous in preventing it from being brought into places where there are a number of troops. On the other hand, there is such a profit in supplying it that many attempt to do so. The weather at Harper's Ferry during the summer was very trying. During the day, the heat would be intense, 
100 to 115 degrees in the tents. The glare of the sun from the white tents and trodden clay of the streets of the camp was like the heat of a baker's oven. The sun went down in a blaze of glory, the sunsets being something beyond description. The western sky would be a sea of translucent mother of pearl with rosy islands gradually changing from one hue to another so that at dress parade men who were far from romantic would sometimes let the orders escape them while watching this marvelous picture spread upon the clouds before them. When the sun was fairly set the air became chill and the dew heavy. The men slept in their clothes with their blouses and overcoats over their blankets and even then were often cold. The sentries and pickets sleeping without cover would wring the dew out of their blankets every morning as if there had been a rain. It was a singular experience to be on sentry duty from 3 to 5 a.m. A heavy overcoat and the exertion of walking one's beat was insufficient to keep one warm. The gun barrel was like an icicle so that having no gloves the men often wrapped the coattails of their overcoats around it so as to be able to carry it. And suddenly, after two hours of walking, the sentry, while still chilled to the bone, would see the sun shoot up over the mountains like a great red football, and in half an hour, the thermometer would be at 90 degrees, and he would be wishing he could find a shady place. Frequently, the monotony of the hot days and cold nights would be broken by a heavy storm. A small cloud would come up over the hills, and in almost no time a gale would be upon the camp. Some of them were corkers. And in these, the rain descended in sheets, the thunder roared, the wind blew a hurricane, and frequent flashes of vivid lightning made it almost as light as day. The scene it illuminated was unique as a hundred tents rocked in the wind and the flaps cracking like loose sails on a vessel struck by a squall and five hundred officers and men in various stages of undress were to be seen hard at work outside their tents soaked to the skin by the pelting rain some holding on to the guy ropes and tent ropes others driving in loose tent bags and all using a language which was bluer than the lightning. Every once in a while, down would go a tent, the wet, heavy canvas half smothering those of its occupants whose confidence in the security of its fastenings had induced them to remain inside. Their efforts to crawl out from under the wet canvas were most amusing to everybody but themselves. The most pleasant part of the day was between dress parade and tattoo. The heat had then abated and the cool of the night was most refreshing. The men would gather in their company streets, tell stories, crack jokes, sing songs of all kinds, patriotic, college, and sentimental, those with a rousing chorus being the favorites. Many of them now middle-aged often recall these hours as among the most pleasant of all that linger in the memories of the experiences of a busy life. Most of the songs sung by the soldiers in the field were pathetic rather than warlike. John Brown's body Rally Round the Flag and Tramp Tramp were favorites, but there were more like Who Will Care for Mother Now? The Vacant Chair and similar songs which seemed to be more admired. Marching Through Georgia was not known until after the war. 
One of the most curious things in regard to war songs is that Dixie, which had originally been a Negro minstrel song, was a campaign song of the Republicans during the Lincoln campaign and was taken up by the South after his election. The flies were a terrible nuisance in the camp. They filled the tents and swarms and buzzed and bit so that resting, reading, riding home, an important part of the soldier's life, were almost impossible. Letter writing in camp is usually done on a tin plate resting on the knee and requires industry and ingenuity and usually produces a cramp somewhere about the writer's person. The addition of a dozen industrious and hungry flies elevated this practice into a penance. Another great inconvenience was the want of change which was the only shape in which money had value. All coin had disappeared with the rise in gold. Fractional currency had not yet been invented. And it was almost impossible to make the small purchases of berries, milk, which added so much to the army ration and to pay for the washing of the soldiers' underclothing the receipt from which appeared to be the sole support of the females of the neighborhood. Postage stamps were used to a considerable extent, but the trouble was a constant and serious one. The New York Times reporter wrote for the September 1 edition, Slaves continue to enter our lines in considerable numbers at Harper's Ferry. Lewis Washington, a rebel colonel, has lost a large number. His elegant residence, about four miles out of town, has thus far been unharmed. He is the same ignoble descendant of General Washington whom Captain Cook arrested at the time of the attack on Harper's Ferry. Many of the Union people here complain that while their houses are mutilated, the elegant residences of rank secessionists at Charlestown, the county seat four miles distant, are unharmed. There is some grounds for this complaint. The desolation of war is seen on every hand. Uh, it was a favorite theory of Paley's that war is a divine institution established for removing the inequality in numbers which exists between the sexes. What would he say were he living at this time when our young men are falling like leaves of the forest in this unhappy contest? <laughs>